it looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that that big. The way it moved, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. Hey, go, 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 go. Hey, take a hey, get away from that. Don't touch that. Get away from that. Get away from that. Get away Those Jawas have been messing up my intro for weeks. I didn't know that the Jedi listened to my show. (laughs) Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you. Tonight, we're going to be chatting with uh, Tanner. And Tanner comes to us from Missouri. He had an encounter back in 2013 while hunting with his dad. And it's a very strange account. There's a lot of twists and turns in his account. And the fascinating part about Tanner's encounter is he never actually saw the creature. Uh, He was out there with his dad. I'll let him uh, go through his encounter, but a lot of very strange things happen to those guys. We're also going to be chatting with Hunter. And Hunter comes to us from California. Uh, He was camping with a friend of his back in August of last year, and their camp was surrounded. Uh, In Hunter's case, they did see the creatures, uh, and they tried to make a quick exit. Uh, A lot to take away from it. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Tanner to the show. Tanner, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Wes. I've, uh, I've listened for a really long time. Uh, I do lawn care as a profession, so I have a lot of time to listen to podcasts, and yours has become the only thing that I listen to every day while I'm on the mower. Oh, I appreciate that, man. Thank you for that. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, and again, thank you for being here. And I know your encounter took place in Missouri back in 2013. Um, if you would, would you kind of just take us back to that moment? Kind of what were you doing? And and walk us into what happened. What did you guys experience out there? So, um, 
that fall, I had had knee surgery. I had my ACL repaired and um, my meniscus. And so while I wasn't completely off my feet at the time, I was still hobbling around. I was using one crutch mostly, but uh, I was really unable to do much walking. So going into deer camp, it was kind of iffy whether or not I was going to be able to go out at all. Um, fortunately for me, there was a side beside there. Normally I'd take a four wheeler. I couldn't throw my leg over a four wheeler, but, um, my dad drove me out there. We woke up really early in the, let me backtrack a little bit. Actually, as we were pulling in that night, um, he had a spotlight that he had borrowed from a friend and he shined it into the field and there was Oh man, 60, 60 pairs of eyes, you know, from deer that you could just see throughout this field. And uh, a little bit about this property, it's been in this family for over 100 years. It's actually a historical land. It's been there so long. And up until just 20 years recently, uh, there was no, there was a really small cabin on it. But my uncle went ahead and built a much larger cabin behind it. And so we would go down there and stay. And so it was uh, opening morning. It was unbelievably cold that morning. Um, the wind was blowing pretty hard, and it, it had been sleeting. Um, it had stopped once we had gotten on the side beside. side But again, you know, it's 20, 21 degrees. And so we take off up the hill, and there's logging roads. The property had been logged previously. So we ride up the, the logging roads, and we're going – back further and further and he's not really telling me where we're going at any point we're just we're just going and we end up at the very end of this property and this property is a 5,000 acre property so that's a good distance um it's still dark he pulls off to the side to the right side I remember to the right side of the road uh and to the left there was um high lines like high power lines to the left and there was a clearing so you could see off in that and that's where he was hunting in that direction but it's still dark he just knew that was there because of like previous rides and stuff like that so i'm looking to the right it's completely wooded down into this valley again still dark but i kind of know where we're at we've rode it a hundred times uh i had some strange feelings out there before but I didn't feel anything at this point. I didn't have any, you know, nothing like the hair on the back of my neck was standing up or anything like that. I heard what sounds like a, you know, like how a deer will um, snort at you or kind of like at you. I'm yeah. not really sure what it was that. But if a deer was like 800 pounds, you know, and it, it, there was one and then in one direction and I could pinpoint it and. At that point, I did start to get nervous, and I looked at my dad, and being the guy that he is, he was just kind of like, don't worry about it, be quiet, we just disturbed the, you know, them laying down, they were bedding, and then about 30 seconds, 45 seconds goes on, and I hear another one. It's a little bit deeper, and it's a little bit, probably 100 feet to the left of that one, and I'm looking at him, I'm like, dad, there's something, no, don't worry about it, it's just deer, it's just a buck, he's just snorting, he's just blowing at you. Uh, okay, we'll continue to go or we'll continue to hunt. And then it was, it was as if like they all woke up at once. You would hear like something like a deer over here to the left and then you'd hear the same thing, but they all had different tones. And I counted six different tones within this like 10 minute stretch. And I'm sitting there and I'm shaking. I'm, I'm, it's, it freaks me out to talk about it, but I'm shaking, thinking like anytime something's going to happen, anytime something's going to happen. And I look over at him and he didn't seem to be concerned about it. And that bothered me even more because I'm thinking, are you, are you going crazy or is this not as big of a deal as you think it is? And then like, it wasn't a big rock by any means, but we're sitting at the top of a hill, you know, and it comes flying and it hits the front on the side of the side. I'm like, you saw that, right? Oh, that was just an acorn. Okay, okay. Now I definitely am terrified. I'm like, I just, if I could run, I would run back to the cabin. I know it's a long ways, but if I could get there, I would. So we sit there for a little while longer. They're, I mean, and they're making a ton of noise. It's all the same noise. It's that, but la like deep and gutter. I can't explain it. I wish I had some type of technology that could, but 
three minutes goes by and a rock about the size of, oh, in between a golf ball and a baseball hits the right side of the side to side. That got my dad's attention. He was like, all right, it's time to pack it up. He turns it on, he backs it up and he's going along. And I don't know if it was just my paranoia or what, but I swear I can hear something kind of like following us and it's keeping up with this side to side and the side to side's going 25 and that's, that's quick for a logging road you know that's probably not safe honestly because there's a lot of washouts and there's a lot of sharp hairpin turns but it followed us to the end of the the tree line which is up at the very top of the hill and as we get down to the bottom of the hill he looks over and he's like unless you want to be made fun of don't say anything so that was the end of that first encounter. Uh, again, and all these encounters, I never got a chance to see it, which is actually probably more scary to me than it would be if I had gotten a chance to see whatever it was. But, you know, I'm shaking at this point, terrified. Yeah, I bet. Let me ask you, did you ever get a chance to talk to your dad? I mean, uh, he's telling you don't tell anyone about this unless you want to be made fun of. Did you ever get a chance to sit down and, and talk about what happened? He remained firm in saying that it was deer, but he knew it wasn't. He, I mean, I've heard some really large white-tailed deer, you know, snort, blow, whatever you want to call it at you or at someone, and it didn't sound like that. You could tell that's what it was trying to sound like, but it did not sound like that. It had no, like, the bass in it. You could feel the bass and that's what I like. I could, I f if I sit here and think about it, I can feel the bass from them. And he, it wasn't, I don't know. He just, he didn't really want to talk about it, to be honest. He would, it was deer. You got scared because you, you couldn't run, you couldn't go anywhere. And you had never heard a deer do that before, which I had. But so I just always was like, yeah, you're right. And that was pretty much it. Yeah. And deers don't throw rocks. <laughs> yeah. hunters are kind of a funny bunch uh being an ex one i i know them well you know one of the things i i put out a show with uh ron moorhead we were talking about sasquatch and language and the first time in him and i i had him on the show i didn't pick up at pick up on what he was saying at the time uh he was talking about you know they, they can mimic anything these creatures have been known to mimic almost anything um and they're almost perfect at what they mimic the one thing that they can't fool you on is the volume in which it comes out. Uh, you know it's not a deer. You know it's not a bear. Uh, it's just, you know, you always hear the 800-pound owl, the, you know, 1,000-pound deer uh, snorting at me. When this was happening to you, what did you think was going on? Did you think it was Sasquatch? I had known of what Sasquatch was. At the time, I did not think it was Bigfoot. I truly didn't know what it was. I, you know, this... I guess this would be the time that some of those shows that I'm not going to say the names of them, but some of the shows that were centered around, you know, Sasquatch or Bigfoot were on TV. Um, but they weren't the most educational, you know, and that's not really what the, that wasn't kind of stuff that they were receiving as far as what, when they would go out in the woods, that's not what they were getting. Looking back on it, the way the sound was, was almost like a horseshoe. Where, like, if I could go and pinpoint where each one was, it was almost like a horseshoe. And I would say, you know, they the distance between each one varied. But it, they every time, it was like they knew when the other one was going to do it. And I think what it really what really happened was, was we had disturbed a hunt. They were coming up that, that ridge. It was right next to that power line. They had... A clearing to see off into if a deer happened to run across there or something they had easy pickings you know i mean that's the only thing i can think of because otherwise you know you're left wondering what if or what is it and i in my heart i feel like that's what had happened i gotcha well tell me about the next incident because i know it all kind of happened on this property did did the next encounter take place in the same general area where this one happened yeah, yeah. It's uh, so a little bit more about this property. I don't want <clears throat> to give exact locations away or anything, but it's it's close to uh, the University of Missouri's um, testing 
they're crop testing. So if they, they go and they test crops and they put them up against different, you know, uh, different climates, more water, less, less precipitation, more precipitation, all of that just to see what they can get to grow in each type of climate, each type of environment. And it produces large deer. Um, there's been some large deer taken in that area. Um, we, I didn't get a chance to write this on the fan page, but um, we were going, riding on the side by side, just going down this holler that actually was going to go into um, the main field that opens up down like into everything and you can actually see the road that leaves the property. Um, and my dad just slams on the brakes and I'm like, what? And he's like, be quiet, be quiet. And you know, I'm looking off down into this ravine, this little valley, if you will. And I, I don't see anything. I see nothing. I'm looking, looking, looking. And he keeps looking through the scope, keeps looking through the scope. Well, finally it was an older gun and it had a, like a flip over scope on it it was my grandpa's and it had a flip over scope on it he couldn't see through the scope and he fired well when he fired it was like the woods came alive all these deer scattered everywhere except for the one that he shot at and i thought that he had killed her because she just it was a doe she just fell down well uh he always carried his friend always carried a nine millimeter with him just to put put it out of its misery if it you know if it would happen to have a rough time of maybe completely having a proper kill on it or whatever need to have. he just brought it with him just in case so they walk down there and she's lying completely still and they get to within three feet of her and she hops up and he hit her in the jaw and her jaw was hanging off and she looked at them looked back up the hill looked at them again and then took off and we heard something maybe 20, 25 feet up the hill and really dense brush take off. Did never saw anything. And this isn't daylight, but you never saw anything chased that we chased after that doe looked for blood, looked for blood for probably over two and a half hours. And, you know, we had a trail for a little while and then it just stopped. Well, uh, we hunt that evening and the next morning we're going up and there's one main road that you have to take before you can go and split off into the other roads. <laughs> and that doe was laying there on the road, except she had all of her guts were gone. And it was like her neck had been snapped. Her legs ripped, not off, but out of socket. And it looked like where her spine had just been beaten three, four times by what I can only imagine is either a very large thing or a rock. And it's in the middle of this road where everyone can see it. And I know it's the doe my dad shot because, you know, obviously the jaw is still dangling there, but like the neck snapped completely snapped, turned sideways. And I asked him, I was like, you know, there's no way that this, she could not have done this to herself. And he kind of looked at me and, yeah, well, I don't, and then just got back on the side by side and took off. Well, we went and uh, that evening we were just, he was never really big into sitting down and hunting. He liked to ride and, you know, more or less be a four wheeler hunter. And so we come back, the doe is gone, but the jaw is still there. And it's like it had been ripped off and it was just sitting there. And I asked him and he just drove right past it. He didn't look at it. He didn't say anything about it. He just drove down the hill and parked it, went inside. And to be honest with you, I think he got like, he had to drink because of that. And I've asked him about that since then. He refuses. He will not talk about it. That's pretty unnerving. It's really unnerving. Why do you think it left the jaw behind? I don't think it was really very happy that he had put such a poor shot on it. Maybe I don't, that's, you know, I know that these creatures are intelligent and I believe them to be something that knows 
more than more credit. We don't give them as much credit. At least the entire population does not give them as much credit as they should be given. But I almost want to say it was kind of like a, a warning or something. I'm not. I'm not sure. You know, like we've my the last encounter I had or the next encounter I have. It's not like I had anything happen as far as physical i didn't get in any to where i was harmed in any way but that felt like it left negative connotations to it it was like you messed up you royally messed up and it, it scared me so bad that i didn't want to go out the next day i did but i didn't want to go out the next day yeah you're in tune with it man i don't i think i would have felt the same way you did i, I don't know that i would have went back it's just kind of a weird thing to happen to have it leave the jaw that he shot and take the rest of it. And he saw the damage done to the deer. Uh, what what happened when you guys went back? So we go back that night uh, or we go in, you know, we go to sleep. That was the evening. And then the next morning. So this happens over like a three or four day span. Nothing happens on the last day. It's the last day of deer season. Uh, we're hoping to get something. But, you know we like deer meat but it's not like we have to have it and i feel for the people that do have to have deer meat and can't get it i know that's always a hard thing to do is, is to leave the woods without you know getting getting food um but we went out and i actually sat down um on a on a tree i hobbled over and sat down on a tree and i fell asleep for a good amount of time nothing happened during the morning we came back in and we ate breakfast uh you know, we went back out and it was, it was kind of like a ritual, I guess, uh, for everybody to meet up in this one spot. It, it was going to be someone's last night there and they would drink and have a good time and all that. Well, we're all sitting there. It's pitch black. Can't see in front of your face. And I'm sitting off to my side, just kind of listening to them and you know not really taking it in i mean i am taking it in but i'm not listening to what they're saying they're adults i'm still in my young 20s i'm not interested in the same things that they are but you know they're like did you see that deer there and just shooting the crap and so they're sitting there talking and i start to hear something slowly move up the bottom of this hill we're sitting on the very top of another it's all this is is it's valleys and hills. This entire property is valleys and hills. And we're sitting at the top of this, this hill, and I can hear something, one set of footsteps, and it's not, it's not a deer. There's not a chance it's a deer because, you know, deer, there's, it, you can just tell if you've been out in the woods long enough, you can tell the way a deer walks or you can tell the way a human or a person or a bipedal animal is going to walk. Well, at first I hear one. And then oh, five seconds goes by or so, and I start to hear two, and they're walking, but it's like they're walking. It's just they're synchronizing their steps to make it sound like they're a deer, but you can tell it's not deer. And I'm sitting there and I'm listening, and at this point, I've completely tuned out whatever everyone else is saying, and I'm listening, and they're getting closer, and they're getting closer and like they get to the point where they're probably within 10 to 15 feet. They're getting ready to step on the logging road. And in my mind the whole time, cause I was not thinking Bigfoot. Um, I, I was scared. I was definitely scared. I, I had no idea what it was. I didn't know what it was. I walked over there, hobbled over there. Uh, I had a 30 on six. I had gotten it for my birthday that year, Christmas. I can't remember. Um, I loaded one in the chamber and I fired it off in the air. And the next thing after the percussion of the gun and them kind of like hollering or whatever, the next thing I hear is, and I can't mimic it. I'm not going to even attempt to mimic it, but it was something, something very like garbled, very hard to understand. And only have I, now that I've played it back in my head a million times every day, basically, it was something, something saw us take off. And then they they didn't run back down, but they definitely moved much quicker down the hill than they did up the hill. And that's when I was like, we need, and 
you know, excuse my language, but we need to get the hell out of here. And they kind of made fun of me and they were like, well, are you just scared of some poachers or what? And I was like, I, I don't know, guys, I just, I'm ready to get back. And so we go back and I fell asleep just thinking about that. I was like, there's no way they didn't come up with, they had no lights. There were no lights and there were no lights going back down. And this is thick, thick brush. Like you have a hard time traversing it in the daylight. How are you going to do that at night? And I'm thinking about that and thinking about that. And I fall asleep. The next morning I wake up with what I, I didn't have a sip of alcohol, but it felt like the worst hangover of my life. Like my head was just splitting and I felt sick to my stomach. Um, it was like that all day. In fact, we were going to try to maybe hunt that morning. And I told my dad I was sick, that there was no way I could. And we ended up leaving uh, that morning. Yeah. Have you been back to that property? So after, after that, that year, um, they took off a lot of the trees. They started logging them again. And there was a bit of a dispute between the family as to who and who could not um, come up to, to the property. And I, for, for several years, I tried to go back. Um, they didn't want anybody to go back. I just now have the opportunity to go back this um, coming year if I want to. But from what um, some of my family has told me, they say it's night and day different. And a part of that kind of scares me um, because I've listened to your podcast. Like I said, I'm, I'm on a mower a lot and I have a lot of free time uh, to listen to things. Not saying I'm not working, but I just, you know, I, I have headphones in all day long. Um, and it seems like change is not something that these creatures really enjoy especially when you take away cover for them, they're essentially their home. And I would, I'm, I tend to believe that there has to be some pretty serious things going on out there. If that is what it is, like I said, I never saw anything. And I remember thinking when I came back, this is how crazy I felt. I, was watching those shows, you know, and again, I won't say any names, but all of the Sasquatch shows, I was watching them and I was just like, please, God, let them find something. Please let them just anything or let them hear what I heard. Let them any, just something. And there was one of the shows, I'm not sure which one it was. Um, it was actually close to, it was uh, in Dent County, which is sim somewhat close to where I am in Missouri. Uh, this man said he had had a Sasquatch on his property and he had been leaving deer jaws. And I, I was like, wow, that's interesting. And come to find out, it was the man thought the reason that they were leaving deer jaws was a sign to not go hunting. And that is kind of the feeling that I got when I saw that deer jaw. It was kind of like, you had your chance. You messed up. This is our property. We don't want you up here. Yeah, it's a fascinating encounter. It's a really fascinating take you have on the uh, deer jaw. And I always like to ask eyewitnesses because I value what they what they think and their opinion at the time as far as what do you think was going on. Um, you know, after eight years, did you ever get a chance to chat with your dad? Because, you know, deers don't throw rocks, like I said. You know that. I know that. Your dad knows that. And most of the time, humans don't throw rocks at other humans. They might get away with it in the cities, but you go out there in the country and you start throwing rocks at hunters and you might get shot. I'm just curious, after eight years, after all this time has passed, have you ever got a chance to sit down and just talk with them about everything that happened? I have. I've, I've made, I would say, four attempts at it. Um, he downplays it significantly. And he seems to recount it completely different than I do which bothers me because that leads me to believe that either one, she's lying or two, I'm crazy. But I think he never expected anything like that at a deer camp. He was not a big hunter anyway. Like I said, he, he rode the four wheeler 98% of the time. He may sit, he never trot climbed into a, a deer stand or anything like that. He was mostly on the four wheeler. And, you know, he did maybe 20% hunting and the rest of the time he was just there to have a good time. 
which I completely understand. You know, that's a deer, yeah. deer camp, deer season's a fun time. And he's not been back since since that time. So obviously, you know, if you put two and two together, something scared him because he's had the opportunity to go back a couple times. And I would have to, um, I just happened to be busy. Uh, but he he chose not to, and he always made excuses to. Well, you you can't go, so I I don't want to go by myself. But he he had plenty of really good friends that were down there, you know, cousins, whatever, that were down there. And his 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 uncle was actually the one that owns the cabin, and they were very close. So he that was not the reason he didn't want to go. You know, there was an obvious reason, and I believe. It was because of what we had both experienced. Because he was there every time um, something happened. Yeah, I hear you. And I appreciate you sharing the encounter, Tanner. You know, a lot of hunters, they'll have these type of encounters to where rocks are being thrown at them. They're hearing weird vocalizations. They can't pinpoint to a known animal. And a lot of times they'll brush it off, uh, even, even more so after they see the creature. Um, you've heard me say it a million times on the show. Hunters will always go, oh, I saw this weird bear. I've never seen Sasquatch, but let me tell you about this weird bear I saw running around on two legs. And I, I think hunters don't want to, most hunters don't want to accept, they, they want to find some other reason why, the, what this thing is or what they saw, because they don't want to give up hunting. And I get it. I completely get it. And I really appreciate you listening to the show, Tanner. Let me ask you, after all of these years, eight, almost nine years now uh, after this encounter and looking into it and listening to other people's encounters, what's kind of your take on what Sasquatch is? And again, there's no wrong answers, but I'm just curious on your thoughts. I, I mean, you know, everybody says this. I knew you were going to ask this. They, you know, they're obviously flesh and blood. You can, there's been, you know, people that have, hurt them or you know they've they found blood trails of theirs or whatever but that's are because you have to attribute some of the like i or you don't have to but in my mind the lights have to tie into them somehow and i i've i've seen the lights so on that property so it it's very bizarre to me that the only place in my life that I've ever seen lights like that is the same property that I happen to think what I, or happen to encounter what I believe to be a Bigfoot. So they're flesh and blood, but they have something about them that I'm not sure we can comprehend. I don't know that we can sit here and say with, without a doubt that they're just, you know, something off of the, off of the tree off of our tree a little bit it's in between us or they're, they're the missing link basically we can't sit here and say that 100 percent. and if it was just you know us seeing big monkey looking guys running through the woods that would be one thing but like like you said i have listened to hours of your podcast your podcast alone and that isn't what people are experiencing if that was i wouldn't feel the 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 terror or you know just as as scared as i do to be in the woods at dark yeah no I, and i appreciate you sharing it i think um there is something else going on with sasquatch there's a lot of weird things that go on uh with sasquatch and you know we like the lights we talked about the lights uh before we went on the air and i was telling you you know on a lot of people's property not so much in people's encounters when they let's say they're out hunting and they just come across a creature rarely will they ever talk about the lights but people who have these things on their property generally will talk about the lights these weird lights flying around tell me about your encounter with the lights what happened so just a month or so before um, all the all of the encounters happened, we had came down. Uh, they had had uh, like a fish fry and a lobster, or not lobster, uh, shrimp boil, shrimp boil, and uh, just a big meal. And there was quite a few people there. And there was this there's this creek, but it's much larger than a creek that you drive over, and it's got like a uh, concrete cylinders underneath it that you can kind of use as tubes to slide through. So 
like in the summers we would swim in them and then you know in the falls we would go down there and just kind of sit next to it and there were you know neighbors that would come over and we would talk to them or whatever and i had been down there and i was talking to a guy that i had only known down there and it was just um him and i and we're sitting there and you know there this isn't the time for fireflies but uh like out of this little meadow uh a light i would say the size of a it started out as a softball it was it slowly floated up and then it kind of just paused there and i saw it first and i was like hey man do you see this He's like, yeah, yeah, I see it, I see it. We should leave. And I was like, no, let's let's see what's going on here. In a way, I felt like it was looking at us, and then it floated up a little bit higher and got a little bit bigger, but it changed color. It was originally it was blue, and then it went to like it went from blue to yellow, and the the change was it was really pretty actually. It was something I had never seen before. And it kind of started coming towards us, and we got nervous. And then, as cl- it didn't get very close, but um, as soon as it was coming towards us, it darted back towards the woods, and went kind of towards the trees, and then just sort of fizzled out. Um, the light itself lasted maybe ten minutes, but. The way it changed color and everything, I knew it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a drone. It wasn't anything like that. It had to have been, it was, I thought maybe it was a ball of lightning, honestly, at first, but it wasn't that either. I can't explain it. Yeah, a ball of lightning is pretty rare. It's pretty rare to come across a ball of lightning. I have heard of these these weird lights actually growing and shrinking. And so you would say at its largest, it was about the size of a basketball? Yeah, it was like, I would say, like a basketball. It was about the size of a basketball. And it it kind of hovered above, um, I think they had soybean in that year. I can't remember. But it hovered maybe like five feet above that. And then it, while it was just sitting there stationary, which I know of nothing that can sit stationary with a light unless it's a flashlight or something. And at first we thought maybe a flashlight, but it wasn't that either. And then it grew up. Uh, and it was small at that point. It wasn't as big. It was probably the size of a softball. And then it grew into a basketball as it started to float up. And then when it came towards us, it started to – and when it, as it grew, it was changing color. And when it got to us, it was like a vibrant yellow. It went from a blue, and it was changing color going up. And then when it got to us, it was a vibrant yellow. And when I say when it got to us, it was 50 feet away probably. And it took off and it went much faster and it went towards the trees. There's just a straight row of trees and it kind of just dissipated in the trees. Did you, did you hear anything or did it make any sort of noise or sound? Not that I can remember. I was, I was in shock. I had a phone in my pocket. I could have very easily taken video camera, you know, anything, but no i don't i didn't hear any sound it it seemed like it had a purpose it didn't seem like it was just randomly you know flying around willy-nilly it it had a straight path towards us and a straight path towards the woods so it's to me it seemed like it had a purpose yeah a lot of people i think more people see the lights than they do actually sasquatch What's your take on the lights? What do you what do you think it is? Uh, uh, growing up, I was told that they, they were swamp gas. Well, we don't really have swamps around here, so that's hard for me to believe. And then they were called booger lights. You know, you weren't supposed to go near them. My grandma and my great grandma would always tell me, you know, if you see booger lights, that's the booger trying to get you or whatever. And I think maybe in their minds, the booger was Sasquatch. I'm not sure. Um, but I, to, to be honest, I don't, I don't know. I know they correlate to, in my, in my opinion, I feel like they correlate with the creatures. I don't know. It could be anything from like a homing beacon to like 
if they are otherworldly and that's not how I feel, but if they are, cause I am open to anything, uh, on the Sasquatch front, if they are otherworldly, maybe that is them as an energy form and they can move throughout as, uh, as a ball of light. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. It's very strange. You know, I'm glad that you brought up the booger lights, uh, cause down in the South, if you ask a lot of the old timers out in rural areas, um, what are those balls of light? They'll call them booger lights. And, you know, and it's strange that they correlated boogers with Sasquatch. Cause if you ask them what a booger is, they'll basically describe a Sasquatch to you, but these lights they'll call booger lights. And it's weird, even like in the South, if you go to uh, Home Depot or Lowe's and you ask for booger lights, uh, they'll give it's they're basically big spotlights you can put on your property. And you know, the booger is where we get the boogeyman. It's the boogeyman that's going to get you when you go out at night. Uh, it's very strange that they correlated the, especially old timers, that they correlate the lights and they call them booger lights. Right. And you know, like my grandma has seen them. She's seen the lights. She's never seen Bigfoot. And you know, we hear she has a farm. I live a quarter of a mile away from her farm. Um, and there's been weird sounds and stuff out there. Not anything like to, to write about or anything like that. Just peculiar sounds, but she has seen the lights out there on her property. And, you know, she, she's described different colors and she always calls them the same thing. It's a booger light. And my great grandma called the same thing, booger lights. And they all said that they had seen them. My mom's seen them. So it's definitely something real. What it is, I don't know. Yeah, it would be nice to know what they are. I know a lot of people see them, and it would really, it'd be really nice to know what they are. They're so bizarre and so strange. And uh, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on, Tanner, and share what happened to you on this property. Uh, I know you didn't see the creature, but the whole everything that happened from beginning to the to the end uh, is fascinating to me. And uh, thank you again, man. Thanks for coming on. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And next up on the show, I want to welcome uh, Hunter. Hunter, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I appreciate you being here. And I know your encounter took place uh, last August, last year, and you were out with a friend of yours. And you were telling me your your friend was pretty skeptical of the existence of these creatures. Yeah, he didn't thought it was a big joke. He didn't believe anything. So, Yeah, nothing wrong with that. I think a lot of people have to see it to believe it. Um, and it sounds like your friend's opinion m might have changed after that night. If you would, take us back to that moment. Kind of, what were you doing? And and walk us into what happened. Yeah, so we just decided to go camping. It was during the middle of COVID, a weekday. So we didn't have anything going on. He was, previous days, he was just at home watching uh, B Flick, Bigfoot movies. But we decided we were camping. So we go up about... 20 minutes from the entrance of the Rubicon trail here in California up ice house road. And we were trying to find uh, a place to camp that was close to a Creek where we go trout fishing. So we're on my Garmin looking around to find a Creek and we find one. It's kind of off of a logging road. So we roll up to a logging road. It's got a gate gates unlocked, but it hasn't been open for a while. Cause we know that cause when we opened it. We got uh, stung by wasps and we drive in about a mile and a half, two miles. And I look to my left and I'm like, oh, it looks like a tree structure. And he sees me looking at it and he kind of has an idea of what some of the things are. And he goes, and he just, Hunter, no. I'm like, I haven't even said anything and I'm trying to be quiet because I don't want to make fun of me for Bigfoot because a lot of my friends do. And uh, anyway, we keep driving and we get about another mile in and there's a big turnaround and we're like, oh, we'll, we'll keep going. So we go about another 300 yards and there's a bigger one. And that's where you decide to set up camp. Uh, we unload, we go walk down the Creek, walk up and down it. While we're walking up and down the, the Creek, looking for a good fishing spot. My buddy Chase is just, he's making fun of me, Bigfoot stuff. So he's whooping. Um, he's doing tree knocks while we're down there, but he kind of gets bored with it and he stops. And this is early in the day. And he does do it a little more when we get back to camp at about seven. But after that, there was no more. 
So split up to go get some uh, firewood. And about 7.30, I'm up the mountain, and he's down. And towards where the first turnaround was, that direction, um, I hear what sounds like a wood knock. And I'm like, okay, I'll just kind of keep that in mind, but I'm not really thinking anything of it. Um, I know Chase isn't that direction, so it's not him, but it could be just rocks or something falling. I don't know, a tree falling. But uh, so come back to camp, do dinner. Um, about nine o'clock, I'm kind of making a comment about the, how dark the forest is, but the sky is still super blue. And then about 920, when it gets actually dark, um, we hear a big stick break to the north side of camp up the hill. Uh, pretty close. So we kind of shut the music off. I've shined my light. We don't see anything. Um, we're quiet for about five minutes and then we're like, all right, well, we'll start moving around again. And as soon as that happens, we hear, um, a couple more sticks break up there. And this time it's not, it's not just the one it's, it's, it's a couple. It sounds like something's walking. So I decided, I'm like, all right, well, we're done drinking. Um, I'm going to pack up my cooler just because that's, if we have to bug out, that's the only thing I really want. After that, I grab my flashlight. We only had one flashlight and I start shining it up there looking for something. And, uh, I see what I'm, what now I know is Einstein, uh, before it just was a green light up the hill, but about only about 15 yards away. It was pretty close. I'm like, Hey, do you see this? And Chase is pretty belligerent. Uh, and he, he sees it and you know, it could be a bear, but I'm like, all right, well, or I'm thinking sap on a tree. Cause I'm shining the flashlight on other trees. And I just see sap kind of gives off like a yellowish green glow, but this is like a, an actual green light. I mean, that's what the uh, reflection is. And Hunter, forgive me. I, I don't mean to interrupt uh, your encounter. I want to ask you real quick about the, this light that you're seeing, and we know later it's eye shine, but um, was it glowing or was it an actual like reflection from your flashlight? It was a constant light, if that makes sense. It seemed to pick up everything that was shined on it, but it wasn't, it, it's hard to describe. Like if, if you shine a light at like um, the sap, it, that was kind of more like a, like a, a sparkly light. This was more like of a duller green tinge kind of. I got you. But and you're only seeing one at this point. I'm, yes, I'm only seeing one. So against my better judgment, I'm like, well, let's throw a rock at it and see if, you know, if it moves. We, we don't know what it really is yet. And uh, he tries throwing a rock and just falls in like a gopher hole or something. And just the rock does not go anywhere over there. So I'm laughing and I pick up a rock and I throw it about a foot and a half away from this. And the, the light gets bigger. I mean, so it was like something, whatever it was, opened its eye. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm kind of freaked out now. I'm going to go walk over and grab the Jeep and shine headlights over here. So this is about 9.35. Uh, I'm walking over the Jeep. Uh, Chase has a flashlight. And down the, uh, the east side of camp, there's an old horse trail. And he starts screaming, it's right there, it's right there. And it was, it was like he flipped a switch. I mean, he, he sobered up immediately. And it was crazy because he could barely he couldn't form a sentence before and now he's just, he's on it. And I'm, I'm trying to yell at him. Like, what are you seeing? And I'm, you know, cause the, the Jeep's kind of a little bit of a distance away. So it's either I'm going to him or I'm going to the Jeep. I can't really rent and do both. It'll take me a couple seconds to do either one. And he's just, he's not, he's not believing what he's seeing. Um, he just said, it's all black. And I'm like, what is all black chase? He's, he's freaking out. He's just almost breaking down, just screaming. And so I run over, grab the Jeep, and I start it up. And it's a diesel, so it idles pretty loud. So he's, as I'm trying to move it over there, um, he's yelling that it's, it's going from tree to tree. And I still don't really know what he's talking about. And then I finally park it over there where he says park it. And he's telling me he's seeing a Bigfoot. It's, it's not, he's like, it's, it's all black. It's got red eyes. He said it flared its teeth in. Um, and it's not that tall that he's six foot. And he said it was only six foot. But he says it was moving so fast. And I'm, he's been making fun of me all day, doing whoops and tree knocks and stuff. So I'm thinking he's just pulling my leg. I'm kind of fed up with him at this point. 
I park the Jeep where he wants me to park with the headlights over there. He said, it's right behind that tree and I'm shining my flashlight. I don't see anything. So I'm not really believing him. And I'm like, all right, well, it looks like whatever's happened, we're, we're going to pretty much leave tonight. So we had, we had stashed a, a bunch of firewood, like dry firewood. I'm like, all right, well, I'm just going to, in, in case, I, you know, who knows what's out there right now, if it's some people, but I'm going to throw on all the dry wood we have right now, just to make the fire pretty big. And it gets like four by four by seven foot tall. It's throwing off a lot of light. And mind you, where he says this tree is, it's down the hill only about 20 yards. Um, and I haven't heard anything yet. And I'm just kind of, I'm just, I'm skeptical right now. About 945, just look, I'm, he's still saying it's behind there. And I'm trying to see, I, I don't see anything at all. But we're taking down camp. So he's freaking out still. And he collapses the tent with the air mattress still, still inflated. And I'm kind of upset with him. And I'm like, really, man? I have to climb in there now and find the plugs and unplug it. I unzip it. I climb in. And while I'm in there, um, something probably 100 yards away screamed. And it was like a, like a high pitched and then like a low, like a, <sighs> like kind of like that. As soon as I heard that, I, I started breaking down crying. I, I just completely lost it. I couldn't, uh, that was, that was the, the real like turning point for me that, okay, something's actually happening. After that, we pretty much, I mean, whatever was behind the tree, whatever was up the hill, we didn't care anymore. It was just throwing as much stuff into the the Jeep as we possibly could and getting out of there. And I mean, we left a, a, the fire going just as strong as it can be. We, we hop in the Jeep and the Jeep, the lights on it suck. Um, Cause I just never thought to, I'm not really into like one of the people that have light bars and everything. So I never had them, but uh, we just book it out as fast as we can. I'm yelling at him to look at the river mirror, see if you see anything behind us. And, He's going, I can't find my phone. And I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure you're sitting on it. And he is, he's like, no, I left it at camp. And I'm like, and I pull off in this, the, the camp about 300 yards down the road. And we're arguing about this. I'm telling him you're sitting on it, man. And he's like, well, no, just go back. And I'm like, I'm not going back there. And he's, you know, he wants me to just drive around the old campsite. And I, I will not. I said, get up. It's, you're under, you're, it's under you. And so he does. And it's under him. So I have to make a, like a U-turn out of this other camp now. And as soon as we make the U-turn, uh, my headlights hit this, this one that it was so freaking big. I didn't really think they ever get this tall, but it was at the time we both agreed. It was like 14 feet tall. Then me and my dad went there later. It definitely was. Uh, but as soon as my headlights hit that, he's, he's screaming and again, I mean, we're both screaming, but and he's just like, oh, my God, it's right there. And I'm yelling, I'm like, Chase, what did you see? And Because I want to make sure it wasn't just me, you know, my eyes playing tricks on me. Um, and he's just like, it was right there. And I'm like, right or left? And he goes, right there. I'm like, right or left? He goes, it's on our right. And I'm like, oh, my God, we just, yeah, we saw the same thing. I, as fast as I can, ripped down that logging road. And I left the gate open. I just, just went straight through it. It was just, we were out. And then that was, I mean, it was, we got, we both got really good looks at that one. And then, yeah, it was, it was, that was, that was, as soon as we got to the road, I got phone service and I had text message coming through. So we pulled over just to have a breather. And, um, this is, this is something that uh, I didn't see it, but mind you, this is only about three miles down the logging road. When you hit the main road, we pulled off right then and there, but a straight shot was probably about a mile. And we're sitting there for a couple minutes. Cause I, I had got like a, a really important text message I was reading and, I'm looking down at my phone, just stopped in the middle of the road. And my buddy's trying to put the, the Jeep in gear. And he's saying, it's right, it's, it's right, it just crossed the road. And I'm like, what do you mean? And so and he can't put it in gear because my foot's on the brake. So if I'm on the brake, I take off. And I didn't see it, but I mean, sure enough, where he said this thing crossed, the, the limbs and everything of the trees were uh, shaking. That was the end of that encounter. Jeez, man, what a night. What a night, you know, terrifying night, really. And how ironic the guy that doesn't believe in Bigfoot actually sees two of them. Um, can I ask you real quick, uh, your buddy that was at camp and he was saying, oh, it's running between the trees. It's running between the trees. Um, did he, I realize at the moment he's 
probably didn't describe it to you, but anytime during that night, did he ever describe to you what, what he was actually looking at? Yeah. So, um, he said it was, it was all black. Uh, it had red eyes and it flared its teeth. At, it said it flared its teeth at him, but he said, uh, he said this thing had canines and it had a, a small snout, which the big one definitely did not have a snout and it had a different um, color skin tone to it. Also, I found that kind of interesting, but that's exactly how he described it. Yeah, that's interesting about the the snout or the muzzle of the creature. Did he describe it? Was it like a, a dog or a canine? Uh, no, we honestly, I mean, like I just saw him last week and he's one of my best friends, but it's just something we don't really have. We've never talked about again. I get it. And that might sound, you know, kind of bizarre to a lot of people, but I think the psychology of, of humans, that happens more often than you might think. Uh, people have encounters and they'll talk about it once and then never talk about it again, or they'll have an encounter in a car and then they'll drive like an hour or two and nobody says a word in the car. Let me ask you, can you describe what you saw that night? Yeah. So, uh, this thing, um, it had, it had pretty, pretty light skin, um, like very, very light gray. All the hair was either gray or black. It didn't have any real hair on its face or its forehead. It had a, um, it was, it was a real super conical. It was really weird looking, but, uh, it didn't look like it had any shoulders at all because the, the hair on its head, it was almost like a, a dreadlock fashion that just draped over its shoulders. So it was just like one shape. Um, and then the, the hair on its arms is probably six inches long. But, and I've, I know people have talked about, you can see the muscles through their, their hair. And I never thought that I would ever see that. I mean, even with hair that long, it looked like there was footballs as it had for biceps. It, it was crazy how muscular this thing was. The, uh, the chest and like the upper stomach had no hair whatsoever. Um, the, the hands went just below the knees. Uh, you could see all the thighs muscles and everything. The only part of it I really didn't see was the, uh, um, or the feet, but like the face, the, it, only, it had like a, like a, like a monkey's face. It had like the, the bigger, like a really big mouth, but like a, like a protruding mouth kind of, um, it had its eyes closed, but you, the eyes were like sunken in and there was, it, it had, it had just tons of wrinkles all over its face. But I mean, and it looked, it just looked old and like it was hanging back while the young ones or something were the ones that were messing with us. Because that, this whole encounter, it wasn't like it was threatening, but it was just they were around, like trying to get a reaction out of us or something. So that that's what was scary. Because I, I mean, I don't know if we would have stayed there, how much farther would have happened, like how much more stuff would have happened, especially hearing the scream, um, and if there was more coming in or what was happening. Yeah, I'm very curious about the scream that you heard that night. Um, there's a recording. Let me see if I have it here came out of Michigan. This is a Michigan scream. And I realized that this is probably a lot longer than what you heard, but I'm curious if the tone was the same. So the high pitch, and then just the, just the, the ear piercing scream at the end with like a roar. I mean, it was just, it was crazy. Yeah, I think a lot of times when people hear the scream, they're so shocked by it because it's so loud. It's almost like getting hit with a sound wave or, you know, a baseball bat or something like that. But if you hear them, if you really listen to them scream, their octaves go up and down. They have like a different pitch, even though it's one tone. The octaves go up and down. It's it's bizarre. Yeah, and I, I've never had something that I mean, I was fine before this. I was irritated with it. I mean, as soon as I heard that scream, it was just I, I started uncontrollably crying. I mean, it was just out of absolute nowhere. I've never had that happen. It was really strange. It's fear kicking in, man. And it's understandable and happens to the best of us. And you know, with regard to what you saw, I, I think that 
I find that fascinating. A lot of people I talk to, they'll say it looked very human-like, like a Neanderthal or a caveman. And then a lot of other people will say it didn't resemble a human at all. And that's kind of your situation. It really didn't resemble a human is, is kind of what I'm getting from you. No, the face, I mean, the body structure looked like it could be human, but the, uh, the face was not human at all. It looked like it had a chimp, like a chimp face. Yeah, that's what they say down south a lot. It looked like a monkey, like a monkey's face, but more on a human-like body. And you know the the size of it, the the size of the creature you saw. Um, you know, the, it, they're more rare, but I think that they do go on. I mean, I've talked to witnesses that have seen them that big. Are they that big in Texas? I don't know that I've had any encounters where they talked about them being that big in Texas. But I think once you get into California, Oregon, Washington up in British Columbia, I think it's very possible that you could run into one that big. You know, the, the experts are going, ah, oh, they don't get that big. You know, they're going to tell you everything about Bigfoot, but I, I, I think they're wrong because I have talked to people who, who've seen them that big. And a lot of times they don't want to come on the show because it's so out of the norm, if you can call this norm. And I'm really glad that you went back to kind of check the area out and do measurements. Uh, you know, the one that me and my brother saw were was nine, nine and a half feet tall. And at that time, uh, you know, I'm six foot. And looking at this thing, I, I felt like an insect. But if you had asked me at the time uh, of the encounter how tall it was, I, I mean, it might as well have been 30 feet tall. You know what I mean? And I'm I'm a short guy, too. And it's just if I didn't have my dad go there and hold up sticks and me and him both look at it, and go, oh my God, it, it really was that big. I, I don't know if it just, I mean, it was, I don't know what the odds are of us seeing it 300 yards from camp, if it just couldn't come closer because it was too big, or I, I don't know how something that big moves around. Yeah. did Let me ask you, did you get the feeling that they were following you out, or do you think the creature was already there when you stopped? I, I think, uh, according to Chase, that was the, the smaller one that was running around camp. He said that looked just like it. So I think that one was following. I, I think it, it was it was like it was playing a game. Yeah, it's a little spooky that you got the impression it was following you out. Um, in a lot of encounters, they'll follow people out. You hear it time and time again. And, you know, I used to think that if you're loud and, um, you know, doing calls and that sort of thing, that it scares these things away. I'm not so sure about that anymore. I think that a lot of times is curiosity. You know, if you hear a, even we as humans, you hear a drunk guy screaming and yelling uh, at the next camp over, we're going to be like, hey, what the hell's going on over there? What's your buddy Chase think about the subject now? They're real. Um, I mean, we don't, our, our, our close friends know about it and stuff. I mean, we came back to my house and he, he lives in Kentucky and he was staying with his mom at the time and he he stayed at my house that night because he didn't want to have to explain to his mom what just happened. But he's a full-on believer now. It's just something that we just don't talk about. Yeah, it's funny how that works out. Uh, let me ask you, Hunter. You know, prior to your encounter, uh, you had a you believed that these things were real. And I'm just curious, what? Why did you think that these things were real and out there running around prior to even seeing one? Um. This is my first time seeing them, but my, my dad actually had um, uh, a couple encounters when he was a kid up at Medicine Lake here in California. He had one. He had to sleep underneath his parents' motorhome, and he had something walk by him that night, and he, he saw the legs. And then the next night, he stayed in the whatever the sleeping area is in the top of the motorhome over the, uh, the cab, and he had one looking at him, like looking through the window. And then I've actually found footprints up in that direction. Um, I've heard several screams over different nights camping in other areas um, up here in Forest Hill. I already had a general understanding, but just, uh, you know, it was, it was something that was fun it, until it actually, like, you see one, you're like, oh, oh this, this, is this is changing camping for me forever now. Yeah, I hate to say it. I mean, everything changes after you see one of these things. Um, with your dad's encounter, did he ever describe what was looking back at him from out the window? Um, not really. He's, I mean, he has like, I, I remember a little bit, but mainly just, he only saw the face. Um, but sort of the same thing. 
they said it had a rounder head and it had the hair on its head was like a was like a fuzz, not actually like longer hair, if that makes sense. But that's all I remember from his. And it was it was his grandparents' property and as soon as they found out that he was sleeping underneath the trailer, they made sure his parents kept him in the trailer the next night. And my dad thinks that they did know something was up there, but they passed on now, so he never actually got to ask them. Did you ever get a chance to tell your dad about this encounter that happened to you and your buddy Chase? Yeah, that night I, I called him to tell him about it, and he got super excited. And I mean, he's always been asking me questions about it. And a, cu- a couple weeks ago, I had to ask him just to stop talking about it because it really bothers me. Yeah, I hear you. I, I think that time helps over time. It, it definitely helps. I, I understand where you're coming from. And I know you were nervous coming on the show, and, and I really do appreciate you coming on. And, you know, it, it never really goes away, but it gets better with time. Um, but, you know, when you do talk about it, you do you, you go right back to that moment. I've had people who've had encounters 50 years ago, and they'll come on and start talking about their encounter and you can tell they're right there. They're back right at that moment. Yeah. I mean, it it just, it it made me think a lot more. I mean, if there's the big one, there's nothing you could ever really do. Like if you hit it with your, your truck, your truck, it's, it's going to still kill you. I mean, it's, it, it was so big. I mean, it just, it falling on you. And this thing was well over a thousand pounds. Yeah, you're right. It's like hitting a moose, you know, it's, it's worse than hitting a moose. Um, I wanted to ask you when you guys had the lights on it and you talked about it, it closing its eyes, did the expression ever change on its face? The eyes never opened. It had like a, like a, it, it was like puckering its mouth. If that makes sense. And you couldn't really see lips. Like it was almost rolling its um, lips into its mouth. Yeah, that's strange. It reminds me of a lot of the native American mass uh, as far as what you're talking about. Um, tell me about when you guys went back, you and your dad went back to the location after the encounter. What happened? Um, yeah, so that was on the sixth and me and my dad went back on the ninth just to go check out. Cause I mean, he, as I said, he was really excited that this happened to me. So in the daylight, we wanted to go see if we could find tracks or just kind of look at where we were seeing the eye shine. If stuff was really actually trampled down where my buddy said it was, um, standing behind the tree and i mean sure enough when we got there uh you you were we saw the original eye shine i mean it was a perfect place to lay prone with a log saying there so you could duck your head in or have your um or if you just moved to your left a little more you could uh duck your head behind a big tree and i'm assuming now that only saw one eye that it just had half of its face showing but it was dark enough to where you really couldn't see it. Uh, I mean, where its advantage point was, was looking down directly at our camp, like 15 yards away. I mean, it was just, it was crazy to actually see like, Oh wow. It was something was actually here. And then going uh, downhill where it said, he said it was behind the tree. I mean, sure enough, there's um, all these broken sticks and chunks of uh, like a rotten log. Everything's taken out. Like something was kind of shuffling around behind the tree. Takes a lot of courage to go back, man. Um, have you ever thought about going back just to camp to see if anything happens? Uh, yeah, I did. I've done it once. Um, and I kind of got uh, like two thirty in the morning. I kind of got upset and I took off on my, uh, my motorcycle. It's a dual sport up there. And I mean, just as like a thing, like, all right, let's see if something happens up here. And I rode like 12 miles down another, um, logging road and then just, turned around and came back and that was that so i mean it it's yeah (laughs) it's unnerving you know even though we want to be brave we want to go back uh you know i struggled even going back to my own encounter where my encounter took place and my brother drugged me there i really didn't want to go uh but it's unnerving you know you you really don't want to be there i get it i don't feel comfortable i I won't i won't ever go back there by myself i mean it's just yeah it's uh, of camping i mean there's got to be more than one vehicle more than two people now for me just because i i I couldn't deal with that again yeah the the other question i wanted to ask you was and this is your opinion and and i want your opinion i realize you're speculating but did you get the impression that it was intimidation to leave or do you think the creatures were just curious on what was going on 
I mean, I don't think that there was any like malicious intent. They were just getting as close as they possibly could and coming around. I, I mean, I really do think if we'd have stayed longer that they would have gotten a lot more. Um, we would have seen them come into camp a lot more because we'd have, we had practically everything happen except for stuff getting thrown at us. I mean, with them circling camp and every, I mean, that's just, yeah, that, that was terrifying. Yeah. Especially when your buddy's hammered Um, and you guys are out camping. I get it. You guys are having drinks. Everyone does it. Um, You guys are having a good time, but you know, in that situation, uh, when people have consumed a lot, they're unpredictable. Yeah. That's uh, I forgot. I mean, because listening to your show, my first pistol was a 10 millimeter. So I'm like, oh, well, that's what I'll just take camping. And I forgot that. And I'm, I'm actually happy that I didn't have it because, uh, I mean, if he would have got a hold of it, he would have started shooting at them, uh, shooting whatever this thing was behind the tree. And I mean, I, I can't say that I wouldn't have if I saw it. Cause I mean, it would, at that close to me, I'm not sure what, I, I don't know what to do. I want to be careful doing that. There's always, it always seems like there's one that's intentionally seen and then there's others around that aren't seen. And you saw that firsthand. The one running around camp was pretty small. The other one that you saw on your way out uh, was a lot bigger. And and that's the problem you run into when you start picking off shots, uh, especially in the dark. I want to ask you, uh, Hunter, and I ask everyone, there's no wrong answer. I'm just curious on your opinion. What do you think that Sasquatch is? I really think that they're just pretty much a, a, a race of just barbaric people. I mean, I mean, there was definitely intelligence of them, you know, coordinating surrounding us. But in the same breath, I mean, that that big one, I'm not sure how it. I mean, it, it what was strange is there was really nothing left behind from where it was standing. I, I figured there would be a, like a clear cut path to the trees of it moving back, and I mean, I've. My my idea of them's kind of influenced a little. I have a friend who's uh, he's had a couple encounters over a fortnight span, and his is pretty s- supernatural. So I'm not really sure what they are. I have an idea, but I mean, what he encounters is not a race of people. Just out of my own curiosity, what what makes you think they're a race of people? And then again, there's nothing wrong with that answer. Uh, just because I mean, listening to your show and stuff. I mean, them just having a. Uh, some sort of a language. I mean, they, they have, they're more intelligent than an ape or, you know, so I just think that they're just a lot more primitive than what we are. And they've adapted to live in the, you know, very harsh conditions. Yeah. And that's a fair answer. I was just curious on um, why you thought that, you know, it, I would say most of their vocalizations are very animalistic in nature. Uh, but it throws you off when they break into that weird gibberish or chatter. And, uh, you know, I, I did a show on Sasquatch language and we were playing Ron Moorhead's Sierra sounds. And I had Scott Nelson, who's a language expert in the Navy. And he was saying how this is language. One of the things he said that I didn't catch the first time I interviewed him, he was saying, you know, even if it's gibberish or it's chatter, it's still language makes you kind of stop and think. Yeah. Um, I've taken a couple, um, a, a couple uh, like courses on speech and stuff, and uh, just for fun. But if you there, there's, I mean, this is very far cases between, but there's a couple of kids that have been found in the woods who I'm not sure how they survived, but they've just adapted and they they're like found at like seven, and they're autistic practically for the rest of their life because they never they're never really you know taught proper ways, but and it's almost like that's to me, that's kind of how Sasquatch is like it's if you actually brought one here and raised it, it, it could possibly be like us. It could speak like us and stuff like I think one of the case I'm thinking of, it's a kid named Victor in, um, from France. Like they found him in the wood, woods in France and he just was never he the rest of his life. He lived like he lived like 40, but he was always very primitive, couldn't never really speak. And it was just because of how he was raised in the wilderness. However, he survived. So that's kind of influenced me, too. Yeah, that's fascinating, man. That's really fascinating. Yeah. I'll have to look that guy up. Um, yeah. If you had the opportunity, would you want to see one again? Um, I really would, but I would like to see it from if I was on a boat and I saw it on the shore or if I saw it through a pair of binoculars on another mountain. <laughs> that's that's how I would like to see one again. Yeah, I get it. I get it completely, man. 
Uh, you know, and it's a fascinating account. I really appreciate you coming on. I know you were nervous, uh, and it, it happened a year ago. Uh, how come you didn't contact me a year ago? Did you think I was going to be mean to you or rip you apart? I just wasn't ready. I mean, I, I typed up your email five days after the encounter and just never hit send. I just left it on the computer. I mean, I was just, and I mean, to make sure I had everything, all the, what it looked like, correct. I put it in notes on my phone that night at like 1am, but just never really wanted to think about it again. Yeah, I get where you're coming from. I, it's completely understandable, man. Yeah, but I, I'm really glad that you did decide to come on and, and share it. And uh, we're all friends here at Sasquatch Chronicles, brother. I appreciate your time again. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for talking to me. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone. 